let's pray. Would you join me in prayer? I just want to offer a prayer for uh, those who have been impacted uh, this week by the shooting in Florida. Lord, we come in Jesus' name, and we, um, we hate to say that in America, sometimes we get numb to the plight of other people because the busyness of our own lives. We just get going, and, and Lord, we recognize that there are people all around us who are hurting and there is a great need for hope. There's a need for a church like this one to be a light in every community in America and around the world. Because there are tragedies. There are crises. There are sinners who commit sin, who choose to break your law and play God. And sometimes it's broadcast over the airways and sometimes it is unknown and will remain unknown until you judge them. So God, we pray today that you would help churches and help Grace Baptist Church to have an impact, to be salt and light. Help us to take serious the word of God. Help us to be concerned, as James says, for the widow and the orphan who is going their own way, who needs the truth of God, who needs the gospel of Jesus to redirect their hearts. So we lift up the, that community in Florida to you, that school, the, the officials. We lift up the families who are grieving. And we lift up our nation in the response. God, I pray that our target would be hearts. And that we would pay attention to the word of God this morning as Jesus targeted hearts. So Lord, would you even now allow us to put that bullseye on our own heart? that we would allow you to speak and to mold and shape and change our lives for your glory. And all God's people said, please be seated. Take your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 5. We had uh, some weather last week and some of you weren't able to come, but we had a great time. In Matthew 5, we're going to retread some of that ground with a little different emphasis. So if you were here last week, great, you'll have that big background. Um, if you weren't here last week, I'd encourage you to listen to it, but we're going to, again, cover some of the same text and draw out some new truth. And, uh, and that's always fun to do as well. It's not new as in it wasn't there and I discovered it, but it was just not covered last week. So We'll say it's new to us, but it is as uh, historic as the ancient of days kind of truth. Last week in Matthew chapter 5, uh, as we began in verse 17, the body of the Sermon on the Mount uh, through verse 48, we learned that Jesus did not come to abolish the law, it says in verse number 17, but to fulfill it. In other words, to bring it to completion. And so... Um, because Jesus fulfilled the law, he's the greatest authority. He's the authority on the law and over the law. And Jesus must be listened to. We must hear Jesus this morning because he completed the law, fulfilled the law. Uh, there were, was a, a book titled the, A Rabbi Talks with Jesus, and it's two rabbis who are uh, speaking and talking and, and having a conversation about Jesus and uh, that one rabbi turned to um, a portion of the Babylonian Talmud and read this and so uh, and uh, and the rabbi expounded and he said six in the book 613 commands were given to Moses David came and reduced them to 11 Psalms 15 Isaiah came and reduced them to six Isaiah 37 Micah came and reduced those commands to three, Micah 6, 8. Isaiah came and reduced them to two, Isaiah 56, 1. Amos came and reduced the commands to one, 
As it is said, for thus saith the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me and live, Amos 5, 4. And Habakkuk further reduced it to one, but his command was, But the just shall live by faith. Habakkuk 2, 4. Have faith. So after that, the rabbis had a conversation. He asked, um, he said, So is this what the sage Jesus had to say? And the other rabbi replied, not exactly, but close. Well, what did he leave, leave out? The rabbi asked. And the other rabbi replied, nothing. Then what did he add? And the rabbi said, himself. Amen. Jesus fulfilled all those commands. He just inserted himself. And he brought all those commands to completion. He didn't eliminate those commands but he completed those commands. So Jesus didn't remove anything from God's law. He didn't add anything to God's law. He just added himself, he fulfilled it, and then he says to us, now come and follow me. Come and follow me. So Jesus is the authority, and he has the right to speak, and we need to listen. And we talked very briefly at the end last week about the perfect love. Um, the perfect love, not like the Pharisees, but the love like God. God's love is impartial. In verse uh, 48, we're reminded, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And the context there is his love was not just to those who loved him. He loved even his enemy because all of us were his enemy and he died for us when we were his enemy and he demonstrated his love. He, he is the summary of perfect love. So, the focus last week and several times, the main focus in the, that section of the remainder of chapter 5 is that phrase, but I say unto you, it was found nine times and we kind of highlighted through those and just focused on that concept that God is the authority speaks and he says to us, in other words, God has the authority to tell us how to live. So we make ethical choices. We have choices concerning our behavior and we need to listen to what Jesus has to say. Jesus says, I say to you. Now today we're going to look at a little bit more in detail at, about the specific commands he had to say. What specifically did Jesus say? What is he commanding? With all of his authority, completing the law, what does he tell us to do? Why did he say these things? So the phrase that we can think about this morning is, you have heard it said. You have heard it said. Uh, they have said this. In other words, um, he's talking about the scribes and Pharisees. They have said certain things, but I say to you. And there's six times that that phrase appears. You have heard it said. It, it's not, well, you have seen it written. Because many of the people Jesus was talking to on the Sermon on the Mount, they didn't own a copy of Scripture. They didn't have the scrolls. It might have been in, in the synagogue, but they didn't have it. And, and it might not even have been in a language that they could have read and understood. So they were dependent upon religious people to expound to them the meaning of all the commands of the law. So you have heard it said. Why these commands? There's six of them. Let's read, and then we'll answer that question. All right, pick up, if you would, verse 21. There's our phrase. You have heard that it was said. By them of old time, thou shalt not kill. Whomever that shall kill, whoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and thou rem their remembrance that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily, I say unto thee, Thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. Here's our phrase. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time. Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you 
that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. It hath been said, there's our phrase again, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say to you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. Whosoever shall marry her that is, committing, uh, is divorced committeth adultery. Again, you have heard that it hath been said by them of old time. Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but thou shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is the, his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. For whatever is more than these cometh of evil. And ye have heard that it was said, that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if a man shall sue thee at the law, take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee, from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. And ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore, what's that word? Perfect. Even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Well, why these six commands? Why did Jesus pick these six? This morning, before our Lord's Supper that we're going to take this morning, I'll just point out two reasons why the Lord gave these six commands. First of all, where we'll spend most of our time, is these six commands expose the gross mishandling of God's Word. It exposes the gross mishandling specifically of the law. Again, Jesus didn't come to abolish the law. In fact, he reiterated earlier that not one jot or tittle will pass away. That's how much detail he paid attention to it. But what Jesus did come to abolish was the unrighteous traditions that surrounded the law. The unrighteous traditions of the self-righteous scribes and Pharisees. He was taking them on head on in these commands. Friends, I want to encourage you this morning. We as a church have to hold the line of Scripture. Right? Think about that. We have to hold the line of Scripture. If you want to write that phrase down and think about it as we go through these six, the line of Scripture. Where do we get that? Well, a professor taught his students, and I was reading an author, and he said, my professor taught me. I, this, I really like this concept. 
His professor taught him to hold the line of Scripture. Um, what does that mean? He says, this professor would say that sometimes people be fall below the line of Scripture. That is, they subtract from Scripture, and that leads them to liberalism. And he said sometimes people add to Scripture, and that leads them toward legalism. And neither one is where Jesus wants us. Liberalism or legalism. Hold the line. Do what the Scripture says. For example, let's take the resurrection for example. Liberalism says, well, Jesus didn't bodily rise from the dead. He just kind of rose in someone's heart or in their vision or it wasn't a physical body resurrection. And that's not a, what a liberal position would take denying the power and the miraculous ability of God to raise Jesus from the dead. But a legalistic position would say, well, because Jesus rose on the first day of the week, you can't have any fun on the first day of the week. It is a somber, serious, solemn occasion. We've got to be sour when we come to church. We can't sing anything uplifting or up, up, and we can't enjoy it because the first day of the week was when Jesus rose from the dead. Well, that, that's nowhere found in Scripture either, is it? That, that we can't ha have rejoicing or anything like that. That's, that's a, legal, a legalistic position. That's adding to the line of Scripture. And the reality is we're all prone to these errors of adding to Scripture or taking away from Scripture because oftentimes what we want is not what the Scriptures are telling us. We want to do what we want rather than to obey the Lord. I heard a story about an American evangelist Peter Cartwright. Peter Cartwright was a man who lost his seat to Abraham Lincoln, his congressional seat to Abraham Lincoln. But he's best known as a circuit-riding Methodist evangelist who God used in a great way, baptized uh, hundreds of, of uh, I'm sorry, thousands of people. His circuit-riding, Methodist uh, uh, riding circuit was in the area of Tennessee and Kentucky. And so he, he was a rugged man personally, and, uh, and he ministered to a lot of rugged people. And one day a man came up to him to test kind of his faith and and to test him, and uh, struck him on the right cheek, and then struck him on the left. And through both of those blows, Peter Cartwright stood his ground and did not retaliate. But then the man, uh, the third time, struck the, ev the evangelist. And, um, and Cartwright, who was a rugged man himself, hit an uppercut, landed it on the guy's face, and sent him flying. And the evangelist said, My Lord hath said nothing about the third stroke. <laughs> well, I don't know where that falls on the line of Scripture, but certainly uh, maybe the, the uh, intent of the, 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 the teaching that Jesus uh, gives us was not carried out by Mr. Cartwright in that particular moment, but we're all prone to it. We're all prone to deviate from God's Word for various reasons. So let's, let's look where the Pharisees were off the line in each of these, all right? Where did they move the line? And most of it wasn't legalism. Most of it was liberalism. They just wanted to do their own thing without regard of God, but they used God's law to justify themselves. Well, verse 21 through 26 is all about the concept of murder. You have heard it said in old time, you shall not kill. It's the idea of not commit murder. But I say unto you that whoever is angry with brother without cause is in danger of judgment. They say don't commit murder, but Jesus was more interested in how brothers, and the word brother is used a number of times in these few verses, so we can talk about how people in a faith community, in fact, the example that he uses is two people coming to worship. Okay, so think of it in this term. Jesus is interested in how brothers, people in a faith community, would be reconciled when there is a dispute. And murder, which is removing somebody from the equation, is not the solution. I mean, just to fillet them open and good riddance and let's get rid of them. But yet, that's what the Pharisees said. Pharisees dropped the bar of Scripture, the line of Scripture, really, really low and said, just don't commit murder. That's crossing the line. But, but nothing else, anything else in there is, is okay, apparently. Jesus intensifies that simple command of one of the ten. Don't commit murder. He intensifies it. He doesn't raise the bar, but he just explains it. This is what, this is what God would want us to do. He said it's not simply about the act of murder, but it's really about the heart 
that drives people to murder. And, and, and that heart can be arrested much, much earlier in the process before it commits the violent act. The word anger here is not the word thumos, which is the Greek concept of anger that explodes outward, that just explodes on people and that has acts of violence that accompany it. That, that one second a person may seem normal and then all of a sudden they, boom, they just explode. That's not the word. The word is the, the word orge, which is the more idea of more of a, a settled, slow, internal, burning anger. It's brooding anger. It's anger that casts an evil disposition on the heart and festers into an infection as time goes on. The Pharisees' simple command was, just don't explode, explode to this, this great thing called murder. And Jesus says, don't even let the heart fester internally. When that type of anger is festering, we have contempt for people. We, we denigrate people. We, we cast dispersions on, on people. It's that kind of anger in a heart that might look at somebody who has just done something to them and caused a little commotion, and they might say it or they might think it. Say, you blockhead. You numbskull. Well, you're just... You're, you guys are looking at me like you've never heard those words before. How many have ever heard blockhead or numbskull? All right, thank you. Like, like you've never said that in your heart. Come on. But, see, I could have used the word raka, but you wouldn't have known that word. You know, the word raka and the word blockhead or numbskull is about the same thing. That's what he says. You know, you say, you call somebody Raka. Listen, you call somebody Raka, you're in danger. Why? Because you've got that festering heart. You're allowing that heart to fester. You better watch it. So you call somebody a fool, you're in danger. You're in danger of judgment. The idea of calling somebody a fool is that, that idea of saying, man, that person, they, they just, they're, they're anti-God. They're without God. They're, you just, you, in a sense, when you call somebody a fool, you become the judge, is the concept. And you're, you're looking down your nose and you're determining that person's outcome. Jesus says the heart should be hauled before the judge at the Sanhedrin or it deserves to be thrown in the city's trash heap called Gehenna. That's the word for fire. It's hell there. What's Jesus saying? That kind of heart is a serious matter. Because it's that kind of heart that leads to the thumos. That leads to the explosion. The soul, the, the, well, we cover it, we allow for it. And Jesus says, no. There's no place for Thumos and there's no place for Orge in God's kingdom. Look at verse 23 and verse 24. Instead of mishandling anger and allowing anger to fester in the heart, we should seize every opportunity to root it out. It makes sense then that in an agricultural society, the time we might see the person that we're angry with would be when we both come to the same festival, or we both come to the same temple, and we're dragging our animal with us, and we're going to go through the, the outward ritual of all of our Old Testament worship, and oh, there I see the neighbor. Now, neighbor, he might be several you know, miles away from me, and I don't see him unless I come to the temple to worship or the Passover festival or whatever it is. And I'm dragging this animal, and I'm looking at him, and I'm thinking in my heart, raka, numbskull, right? Uh, blockhead, idiot, jerk, fool. And I'm offering my sheep to the priest who's taking it and slaying it open because of my own sin. And all the while, in my heart, I'm looking at my neighbor, and I'm thinking those things. Jesus says, listen, there's an urgent need for you. Before you hand that lamb over, would you run to that neighbor? Say, I want to know something. I haven't, I haven't moved any of your borders. I haven't wounded or said anything bad about your wife or your daughters. I've not killed any of your sons, but in my heart, I've not been right toward you. Jesus says, you know what? It's so urgent that you not let 
the heart fester. You stop what you're doing, go get it taken care of. Heart's a serious matter. Take that opportunity, get things right. There's another example he uses in verse 25. It's just a, it, it's a legal example. You owe somebody money, you're going to be put in prison, and when you're put in prison, you can't pay them back. And certainly the person you owe a debt to is not going to come bail you out because they're the one who had you put there. So the urgency of the illustration is if you recognize you owe somebody, do everything you can to pay that debt back. And that's just an illustration on the seriousness of dealing with internal anger in your heart. Don't let it fester. Now, now you, you've got to make a decision today. You're going to take the Lord's Supper. Say, oh man, preacher, are you setting us up here? Before the Lord's Supper, you're going to have us all mingle and look for somebody and say, boy, I need to get things right. That's actually not what I was doing, but you know, it wouldn't be a bad thing for a church if we did. Because we, we have to stop going through the motions. And we have to stop pretending like everything's okay just because we're not exploding on people outwardly. Because God's concerned about the heart. And Jesus says, if you got that kind of heart, you're in danger and you need to deal with it quickly. Verse 27 through 30 moves us to a second command and it's the concept of adultery. And you have heard it said in old time, don't commit adultery. Verse 28, but I say to you, that's not about just the outward act, is it? If you look upon a woman and lust after her, Hmm. Today in our culture, they've trashed this commandment, right? They don't, they don't, they don't care about adultery. Marriage is denigrated. Uh, don't let a marriage document stand in the way of love. The songs we hear, the music that's popularized, the movies that we, you know, even God's people watch, promote adultery. Indulge in it, enjoy it, make it look glorious and glamorous. Talk about dropping the bar of Scripture, dropping the line of Scripture. Friends, we've, you know, to continually view adultery over and over and over is certainly not what God has called His people to do. Well, they say, hey, don't commit adultery, but Jesus says, don't even lust after a woman in your heart. Now, for all the young men here are thinking about one day getting married in the process of courtship, right? He is not saying that it is wrong for you as a young man to find a young lady attractive. And as a former young man who found a young lady attractive, I'm thankful that that was not outlawed by Jesus, right? He's not saying it's wrong for you to be drawn to her physically, emotionally, and spiritually. I think that process is pretty cool. And so does the proverb, right? What is he saying when he says a man shouldn't look lustfully after a woman? Well, it's either the looking of a man upon a woman to consume her for himself. It can be interpreted that way. So man just looking at a woman going, boy, there's things I want from her. It's all about me. That's lust. Or it could mean an alternative interpretation, which I find compelling, is that he is looking at a woman for the purpose of enticing her to himself. So he looks and he schemes to draw her. That's where, you know, the, the later passage it talks about the woman who commits adultery as well. In other words, she is culpable, but you lured her and you enticed her. And it's the you say, well, which one is well, either one, it's the heart, right? It's the heart behind the action. It's the heart that says, I want her, and I'm going to either take it by force, I'm going to use manipulation to get her to come along with it. And Jesus says, that heart is wicked. That heart is wrong. That's the issue, not just the outward action. Again, verse 29 and 30, the internal purity of the heart is so important that Jesus uses pretty drastic images. Pluck out the eye. Cut off the hand. That's, that's, that's pretty drastic. 
What's Jesus doing? Well, Jesus is using those graphic images to emphasize the importance of take whatever, whatever measures are necessary to control your natural passions that flare out of control. That we, we long for something, we want something, and we want it so much that we will sin in order to get it. And he says, man, you've got to put some roadblocks in there. You've got to not give vent. You've not got to give freedom to those things. Man, let's put up some walls. Let's hinder it. Let's, let's remove some things so that your heart doesn't go there. The phrase concerning the eye that offends thee or the, that causes thee to sin in some translations is connected to the noun that stands for the bait that you put in the trap, right? Which when the trap is sprung, it closes and secures the animal. And it's the eye, he's saying, that offends thee. It's the eye, in a sense, that God gave us in creation to help us not stumble. It's the eye that is causing the heart to stumble. So he says, hey, let's redirect the eye. Let's, let's stop looking at some of the things we're looking at. Because the eye feeds the lust of the heart. And the Pharisees were, were way below this line of Scripture. They knew they could get away with lusting. They couldn't get away with adultery. Kind of like the engaged couple who desires to stay pure before marriage asks the question, well, how far is too far? And that's a normal question, but it's also a pharisaical question. See, the sentiment in that question, how far is too far, the sentiment is how close can I get without breaking God's word in a technical sense. Do you see that? But what, what would be a better question? Well, how about, how can I keep the commands of God in every avenue of our relationship? How can I guard my heart? And we're to deal drastically with sin. We looked at two commands so far. And Jesus said, those commands, well, they're actually heart issues. Two heart issues. And they're, they're two challenges to, to deal with those heart issues and to deal with them quickly so don't take joy and delight in hidden inner sin or sins of the heart those sins of the heart are deadly they bring judgment deal with them don't pamper them don't flirt with it don't come up like as far as, as you can to it and, and try to control it don't nibble around the edges of it hate it crush it Dig it out! Verse 31 takes us to the third command, divorce. Divorce. It has been said, don't put away your wife, let give her a writing of divorcement. And again, they've structured all these commands. There's a whole bunch of writings and laws that govern the whole issue of marriage and what God says. And, and so this isn't one of the necessarily ten commands, but it certainly is one that the Pharisees constructed this whole concept about how to behave they took the law and said here's what you have to do if you want to and by the way divorce back then was more prevalent than divorce in america today is you go, well, divorce today is well it's rampant well divorce back then was more prevalent well how did they stay holy and divorce all that all that much well the only restrict if you gave her a bill of divorcement you're okay and they structured the writing of the divorcement. Most of the time, it was the men who were giving the women bill of divorcements um, for any issue. What is the issue? Well, she burnt toast this morning for breakfast. Oh, bill of divorcement. I'm justified. Literally, just about anything that a guy could throw out there, he would be justified in giving her a bill of divorcement. And because he technically gave her a billing of divorcement or a divorce papers, he was free to go pursue another, another female. Now, I really think that the previous command of lust in the heart, he's kind of outing the motive on why men were giving bills of divorcement. I'm not committing adultery with her, so here's what I'm doing. I'm going to give my wife a bill of divorcement 
and then I'm going to go get the woman that I've been lusting after. You see that? So this is the way it worked. And these, these were people who were holy. They'd marry, get tired of her, give her a bill of divorcement, get married, give her a bill of divorcement, get married, give her a bill of divorcement. And it was serial divorce and remarriage. And it was all done keeping the commands of, right? Well, wait a second. Was that what God intended from the beginning? No. God said to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, right? He said, hey, listen, I gave you, here's your wife. And, and Genesis ends with, man, they were enjoying that relationship. How do you know? It says they were naked and unashamed, right? Before sin entered. Marriage is wonderful. Marriage is perfect. What is God's intent? Listen, I'm not ashamed to stand up here and say, God's intent is one man and one woman for life. That's God's intent. And we take it serious. God takes it serious. They weren't. They dropped the line of Scripture. They dropped the bar. Christ said, you've got it all wrong. Unless she separates from you and commits sexual sin and is unrepentant of it, you don't have the right to put her away just because she doesn't please you any longer or somebody else looks more attractive. What are we called to do? What's Jesus calling us to do in marriage? He's saying, hang in there. You've got a rocky marriage? Improve it. Work on it. You've made a vow before God and before man. We're going to live together. We're going to love each other till death do us part in sickness and health and poverty and wealth. We're going to forsake all others as long as we live. That's God's command. D.A. Carson wrote, Love, it's this great definition, is the determined commitment, it's not a feeling, to seek the other's good, to cherish, shelter, mature, edify, and show patience with one's partner. And this commitment worked out because of deep-rooted obedience to God brings with it the emotional and sentimental aspects of love as well. We have a living example of that today in our midst. Bernie and Bonnie Shives today are celebrating their 63rd anniversary. Let's give them a hand right back here. I asked him in Sunday school, hey, anything you want to say? She killed my baby. <laughs> and that's what he said. And he added to that, he said, she's still my baby. And he said, it's all been good. I appreciate him saying that after 63 years. And it's been fun to watch them. The reality is, in every marriage there are trials. You know what they've had to do for 63 years? They've had to example that definition of love. A deep-rooted commitment. And anybody who's been married, you know that's what it takes. A deep-rooted commitment to obey God and do what he calls us to do. And you know what the Pharisees did? They were teaching people, you don't have to be committed. If she doesn't please you any longer, just slip her a piece of paper and send her out the door. Friends, that's a blatant disregard for God and His law from the beginning of time. Jesus says, you've heard it said, but I say to you. He redirects us. Number four, verse 34 through 37, we see uh, Jesus redirecting us in the area of our, our truthfulness. We could say oath-taking, right? They say, don't break your oath. It said verse 34 specifically, swear not at all. Um, swear in a certain way. Hey, what's going on here? They, they say, keep your oath that you made if it was to the Lord. Right? That, that's kind of a, a parameter. Keep your oath if it was to the Lord. The Pharisees created a list of, of, of times when your oaths were not binding. Right? Hey, I promise to do this. And you, well, what are you promising it on? Well, on certain... Okay. 
And they created this complex system that if you swear by certain things, it's not binding. So like if you say, I swear to do this, or I swear this by Jerusalem, use the word by, you're not bound to it. But if you swore toward Jerusalem, well now you're bound to it and you have to complete that vow. What? So people who knew the system, they would swear oaths in such a way they knew they could get out of it and not be held legally liable. Oh, well, you signed this contract. Yeah, but right here I put an asterisk behind that, and so that means I really don't have to do it. And that's, that's what they'd created. And so the whole system of swearing an oath or swearing a promise was set up to deceive and get what you want and not have to fulfill your word and not to be truthful. And Jesus said, I say to you, don't swear at all. Now, he's not saying there, don't take the Pledge of Allegiance. That's not what Jesus is saying. He's not saying, don't ever give your word. In fact, Jesus gives him more, his word. Jesus swears. And what does he swear by? He swears by his own name, because there's nothing higher. Right? So what is Jesus saying here? He's not saying, don't ever make a vow. He's not saying that. What he's saying is, if you are simply playing games with your oath, I abolish those kinds of oath givings. Because what I require is that you be truthful, that you be constant, that you be absolute, that you be determined to do your action that you swear to do. When Jesus says, don't swear by those different things, he's saying, don't swear by Jerusalem or toward Jerusalem, and don't even sw swear by the color of hair you have, right? Why? Because God's in control of everything. God is a part of everything. So whatever you swear by, whatever you base your commitment on, God's in control of it. God's a part of it. So God holds you to it. The line of Scripture is truthfulness. Anything else, he says, comes from the deceiver. It is of evil, the father of lies. Brothers and sisters, we claim to have the truth. We claim to know the truth. How often do we exaggerate? How often do we slant? How often do we fudge? For personal gain. Verse 38 takes us to the fifth, retribution, or the eye-for-eye eye principle. Verse, it says, you have heard it said, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, but I say to you, he gives us a whole list of commands here about how to be selfless. This is family law practice, right? Uh, the law, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, was not designed or given in the law for private revenge. It was given for legal justice. In fact, the eye for an eye principle was put in place um, to limit retaliation. Think about this. You stomp on my foot. I kick you in the knee. You hammer my hip. You know, I knee you in the stomach. Yeah, you go all the way up to where somebody's, you know, knifing somebody in the heart, right? I mean, it's just, well, you did this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. And before long, it just grows and grows and grows. And he says, eye for an eye. So we're not going to go beyond what somebody did, but that's not even the intent. The intent is not for you personally to dispense it. It was given to the nation, not to you as a person. So in general, judges had a way to adjudicate the society. But the Pharisees weren't using it that way. The Pharisees were saying, somebody, you you don't like, did something to you? Man, we're going to get an eye for an eye. You're going to you're gonna get your fair shake. Somebody punches you, we're going to line them up in public square, and you get to haul off and mm, that. No. Jesus says, that's not why that law was given. You got it wrong. Jesus untwists what they had twisted. He says that the message of the passage is for the protection and the good of a society and a community. It prevented the ex ex uh, uh, um, escalation of responses, and it gave the government the legal right to dispense judgment in a balanced way. And Christ says, my followers have a completely different response when they're personally offended. What do Christ followers do when they've been personally taken advantage of? Because this is really hard. It's really hard. But it's not my command, it's Christ's command. He says, if they legally swear, uh, legally sue you and take your coat or dress, right, your coat, your tunic, 
You know what you could do as a, as a Christian, as a follower of Christ? Give your outer coat. What? The overcoat? See, Hebrew law said the overcoat is one's personal possession and could not be released in a legal matter. It is yours. We call them in America inalienable rights. No one can take it from you. It's inalienable yours. And Jesus says, you know what my followers do? They even give up their inalienable rights. Whew. That's his kingdom command. You get punched, turn the cheek. They take your coat, your suit, give them your overcoat. The things that we regard as our rights by law, we must be prepared to abandon. When paying or lending, the hard attitude isn't, well, this is how much interest I deserve, or I'm only going to lend for what's in it for me, or what I can get out of it. Jesus says, no. My followers have no rights. Personal self-sacrifice displaces our personal ability to retaliate. Well, I don't know that Jesus has the right to say that. Wait a second, he fulfilled the law. I don't think Jesus has the right to command me to follow him and do that. Jesus did. As a lamb led to the slaughter, he didn't open his mouth. He didn't condemn his judges. He didn't ridicule those who beat him and plucked out his beard. He's not asking you to give up rights that he himself hasn't given up. Friends, he gave up the glory of heaven. The last one is love your enemy. They say it's okay to hate your enemy, and we talked about this last week. Jesus said, no, God loves the good and the wicked. He gives them both sunshine and rain. Pastor, what's the point? We said it. Don't fall below the line of Scripture. Don't go beyond the Scriptures. Hold the line of Scriptures. When you start tinkering with God, God's Word says, you are in danger. You begin to harbor your pet sin, whatever it is. I'm not saying you're committing all six of those, but there might be one of them that in your mind you're justifying, saying, I don't know about that. I don't know if I have to do that. I've, I'm keeping the others. I'm trying to follow Jesus and those others, but I'm not listening to God's word in that area. So in a sense, we're saying, God, we don't care about your authority. We don't care that you fulfilled the law. We don't care that you died on the cross. We don't care that you've commanded us. And friend, it's dangerous to be in that place. It's dangerous for us, brothers and sisters, to be this close to truth and utterly reject it. That's what the Pharisees were doing. They were that close. They read the Scriptures. They knew the Scriptures. And they were just, just rejecting it because they wanted something different. They wanted serial marriage. They, they wanted to hate people. They wanted to lust. They, they didn't want what God's word called them to do. And they played God. To know what the Bible says and still choose to be your own king and to lift up yourself as one who worships the only one true God is a deadly game that you're playing. The Pharisees and scribes' example of how they butchered God's word should be a warning to all of us. You know, churches can get off balance. Grace Baptist Church, we need to see what the scribes and Pharisees did here and recognize if we deviate from God's word, we're in danger. That's why the discipleship program, it, you know, you say, well, it's, discipleship is a lifestyle, it's not a program. I understand that, but we had to come up with some way in our, in our church to, to help facilitate things that are important. And so we've said, we want everybody to become part of the community. Let's go to starting point class. And if you're here and you're thinking about a church, we encourage you to join with us. Be numbered with us. Okay? Go through starting point class. 
And then we say, hey, listen, we think it's good for everybody in our church to go through what we've called foundations. And what's the goal of foundations? The goal of foundations is that everybody in our church would understand that the Bible has answers for how to live life. It has answers for how to resolve conflict. It has answers for how to function in marriage. It has answers for how we parent. It has answers for what to do when there's sin in the church. It has answers on how to relate to pastoral leadership. The Bible has answers. And so what we're trying to say is, is, is we all want you to, to believe and know that the Bible directs us, that God is, is the authority and it's communicated to, through his word. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction of righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. It's interesting it's that word perfect because this message comes to that point in verse 48 and it says, Be therefore perfect. The man of God might be perfect, completely or thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Brothers and sisters, we want to encourage you. Go to foundations. Understand the philosophy of that truth. And take hermeneutics. Why? Because you need to know if your teacher, pastor, or anybody else is falling below or above the line of Scripture. You need to test. You personally need to test yourself so that you don't abuse God's Word and fall below or go above the line of Scripture. You need to rightly divide the Word of truth. Churches can get off balance. Pastors and teachers can get off balance. We teach the whole counsel of God, not just our personal whims and desires. The best guide for me so that I don't just get off balance and teach what I like is to try to teach through whole books of the Bible at a time. Just say what the text says. Might be something there that steps on my toes. Might be something there that steps on your toes. But we go through all of it. We're going to get it all. We're going to uphold Scripture. You know, parents can get off balance. We get this mindset that says, let's just get our kids through and let's do whatever works. And we forget that the scripture challenges to raise godly kids, not just good kids. We kind of drop that bar. Well, our kids aren't doing X, Y, Z. They're not bringing shame on our family. And so we'll kind of let them skate by with doing uh, all these other ABC sins. We're not going to cause a ruckus or stink. When really, as parents, what we should be doing is, is projecting our kids' hearts toward the Word. At Grace Baptist Church, we, we, we have solidified and agreed upon and teach. There are five core values in our church. Glorify God, reach people, apply Scripture, change hearts, and edify in our relationships. And I think this passage just screams at us, change your heart. Because we can look all nice and clean. We can go through the ritual of worship. But Jesus says, I'm really concerned about what's going on internally. Why these commands? Well, because they really expose the mishandling of God's word.